Dr. Paul Schramm's talk about his new project, Horonaut, takes a look at data visualization and using it as a 3D debugger for other software that you're using. Now, let's take a look at uh, what the talk is going to be about. So, let's welcome Dr. Paul Schramm. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. So, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be giving this talk. Um, I, I do want to apologize up front. Uh, I left my power supply transformer brick in North Carolina, and I didn't realize it until I was on the airplane last night trying to put together some PowerPoint slides, and I realized if I want to use this computer, I need to conserve energy. So, we're going to make it through this talk, but if we don't, we'll do talks like they used to do them, back like in the 20th century where you just talked. So I think we're gonna be okay. Another reason that we're gonna be okay is because, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're gonna be okay. This is a vision talk. And so vision talks don't need to show working software. I'm gonna claim, since you can't prove me wrong, that I do have a, some simple working software. But it's, it's obviously not going to be shown today. So, um, in, so I have worked as a civil engineer using MicroStation a lot in a previous part of my career. MicroStation is a CAD engine, very similar to AutoCAD, and we used it to design roads. Um, and then I've also gone back to school and got a master's in GIS technology. And GIS, as most of you know, but just in case there's somebody in here who doesn't, GIS is Geographic Information Systems or Geographic Information Science. And it's basically maps on computers with databases. And one of the things that is going on is there's, there's two pretty good free open source software GIS applications. But in, especially in America, uh, there's a, a big one that is proprietary, and it means you have to pay a lot. So there's a need, in, in my view, for a free open source software uh, package that is based in a 3D game engine. So I'm, I'm now doing my talk from memory, and, and so if I stammer a little bit, that's why. So there's three needs that I've identified that a game engine can meet. One is scientific visualization, visualization of data that works better when it is plotted in a 3D world and you can fly through it or you can interact with it. And <clears throat> can I get some water? Because I'm going to run out of this water. Um, you can interact with it in uh, augmented reality or virtual reality. Um, sorry? Oh. So, the, um, there's also a need for a non-proprietary non free open source software that does things that CAD engines do. And then I had a need, when I was working on my PhD, I had a need to um, be able to see how my 3D software was working. And I would have to Thank you so much. I would have to take my 3D mesh, so I was working with LiDAR data, doing research on how to decimate the LiDAR data more efficiently, and I needed, and I had to uh, produce and publish a paper on this topic. So it needed some really good explanatory graphs, some explanatory images. What I had to do to get that to work was export it to a wavefront object from my software and then reload it in Unity. And what I really felt the need for was a way for me to be able to use something that was a 3D game engine, or like a 3D game engine, that could talk directly to my other DLL, which was in C Sharp already. Already in C Sharp, that's an important thing to remember. And <clears throat> there were several problems that I was encountering the biggest one is the, um, the world coordinate space. It's in single precision floating point. 
And if you've ever tried to write a space game where you orbit the Earth, but your player can maybe come down to Earth, you realize that single precision floating point is not adequate for that. What's the reason for that? Well, single precision floating point has only about seven significant digits. And then when you get to that last significant digit, the difference between one position and another in any given axis, that, that distance is, ca is called epsilon. And epsilon, for single precision floating point, if your coordinate system is big enough to hold the whole planet Earth in the coordinate system, then your epsilon is about 30 meters. And that's just not acceptable if you're plotting things like, um, say, water meters or stoplights, uh, you know, things that a real GIS needs to be able to do. So I needed software that was free open source all the way up, all the way down. And I needed it to be performant. So the free open source all the way up and all the way down, even back in May, when I was looking around for something, that really prevented me from going with Unity 3D. One of the big things that prevented me from going with Unreal Engine was I just preferred not to work in C Sharp. I'm sorry, in C++. But I want to work in C Sharp. And then the last thing was that uh, floating point problem. I needed a game engine that could run in a double precision floating point. With double precision floating point, if your coordinate system is big enough to hold the Earth in the middle quarter of your world cube, then your epsilon is a, a couple of centimeters or a couple of millimeters. I computed it once, but I forgot the exact number. It's very small. It's certainly adequate for a GIS. So when I found out that Godot 4 has an option to build the game, uh, build the editor using the, the double precision floating point um, coordinate space, that was it. I, I was like, okay, I'm going to go with Godot. And so that, that's how I got here. Um, the, give me a moment here since I can't use this. Um, let me talk a little bit about um, GIS in, in particular. There's, there's two major things to know about GIS. One is the coordinate system. Every place you go has a different coordinate system. For example, in North Carolina, we don't use latitude and longitude for engineering projects. We use this thing called the state plane coordinate system. The state plane coordinate system is in meters or, and alternately in feet, and it's basically a plane draped over the state of North Carolina. When you get surveys or when you get uh, roadway projects, when you get those things, you don't get latitude and longitude. But if you import, say you import data from Virginia, that's in Virginia state plane coordinates. So something has to translate back and forth between coordinate systems. But they're all huge numbers. Uh, if you go to the middle of North Carolina, the, the X distance from the origin is about um, 800,000 meters. And that's just too big to fit into a double precision, a single precision floating point um, uh, world space. So it has to be able to handle those coordinates, and it also has to be able to handle three kinds of files. And, and these are going to be familiar words and possibly not familiar uses of those words. So a geographic information system has three kinds of files that it can read. And one is vector, and one is raster, and then the other is point cloud. And so I, I would love to give you guys sources for where to get these. But let me, let me describe to you what they are. If you have a point, or if you have a line, or if you have a polygon, then that's going to be vector. So what distinguishes a vector? from a raster, well, a raster is just a grid of cells. It's like a spreadsheet where you make the Excel cells in the spreadsheet really, really small. 
And you've probably worked with that in um, putting images onto meshes. That, that's a raster. But in GIS, what we do is we add a little bit of data to that so that the computer knows the latitude and longitude or the coordinates, whatever coordinate system you're in. It knows the latitude and longitude of the top left corner. And then every pixel has a width and a depth. And so you can, for any pixel in the raster, you can compute the coordinates in the real world. The difference between a raster and a vector is that a vector you can have, say you have a, a line vector shapefile. They call them shapefiles. Let's say you have a line and it represents a river. And the river has a point here and then here and then here and then here. You only have to record points at those points where it turns or where it begins and ends. If you did that with a raster, it would be all of these cells along the river and then all of these other cells would be wasted, the ones above it and the ones below it. So for different kinds of applications, different kinds of um, GIS files are better suited. Um, and then the third kind is so you're Okay. Sorry about that. A point cloud is basically taken with a laser scanner of the world that you're in. And so someone could take a laser scanner and put it on a truck and drive down this road. Can we switch to the microphone? Someone could put a, a laser scanner on a truck and it would get a point cloud. He's bringing that. Um, Test, one, two, three. And it would shoot laser at, at the side of the building and at the trees and at the road. And that would generate the point cloud. Usually, um, the, and this system is called LIDAR. Usually a LIDAR is on a drone or an airplane flying over a territory, flying over some land. And that generates a point cloud that shows things like, you can see the trees in the point cloud. And if you have a GIS, you need to be able to use all three of those kinds of data. So the reason this is a vision talk is because I want to tell a little bit about where I think this can go and what I think can be done. Um, basically, it's enable a Godot game. There's a point that I can uh, take a parenthetical statement. Originally, I thought this was going to be better as a Godot editor add-on. But one of the things I found was that I couldn't get control of the viewport. So if I wanted to add a mode of orbit to the camera control, I didn't see how I could uh, do that with a editor add-on. So I switched to a game. So now, you know, when it's running, um, I'm running a game. And I load some LiDAR points. And you can see, sorry, I have to describe this. But you can see, you know, the terrain and you can see the buildings. It's really pretty nice. Um, and so the vision is to develop software under, running under Godot that can serve the scientist doing data visualization. It can serve uh, the software developer who has 3D software that they need to be able to visualize in a kind of in a kind of debug mode. So Godot would have a pause and uh, sorry for the way I say pause, but I'm from the south. It would have a pause, it would have a resume and, and buttons like that and step. It would have step. So you can see what your 3D software is doing in the world with that. But then also a GIS. So if, I, I'm, I'm going to say we, but I don't know who the other people are yet in the we. If we can develop a, a, a young start, you know, start young and grow kind of uh, application running in Godot game, then we can do things like 
make a free open source software application for um, humanitarian toolbox. So the idea of humanitarian toolbox, has anybody heard of humanitarian toolbox? Okay, I'm seeing no. Um, some, some industry leaders in uh, the US and Canada, and maybe in Europe, I, I don't know where all, they basically saw a need for uh, software of different kinds that would be used for humanitarian efforts. So I'm thinking that this potential GIS written under Godot could be another of the humanitarian toolbox tools that could be, would enable people who are managing disasters, for example, to be able to use a GIS that is free and open source. So um, with that, I would like to open it up for questions. And um, if y'all don't have any questions, I, I have one. But um, yeah, questions. And Christoph has a microphone. And so if you want to ask a question, he'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, hi. A uh, quick question, where do you pull the data from, like OpenStreetMaps, or how do you pass them? Okay, where, where does the data come from? Um, there are so many sources. Uh, for whatever country you're in, or if you're in the United States, it's done by state. Uh, you, you can search for GIS resources, and you will find things like, um, for example, things I've seen from North Carolina, you know, they have a website that unifies all of their GIS data. And I think most government organizations do that now. And I went to NC One Map, which is North Carolina's one place to find maps, and searched for dams. And it downloaded all the dams in the state. Or I could give it a, a bounding box and say, um, I only want the dams in this part of the state. And I could also get roads. Yes? Can I show you my implementation? Uh, Can I show you my implementation? Yeah, as a matter of fact, you, if you gave this talk, it would probably be better. <laughs> That's uh, parsing from OpenStreetMaps using okay. uh, lip spatial light. And then because of the 32 and double precision issues, I had to uh, split it up into chunks so that we can load it even in low precision mode. And for example, this is uh, Friedrichshafen, like 200 kilometers from here, and you can move the map. And yeah, it's it's using OpenStreetMap yeah. data and Godot of using and view, uh, visualizing so uh, the stuff like. It looks like you've downloaded some vector files, some feature uh, classes? No, actually it's from uh, Geofabric. It's a German website where you can download the uh, OpenStreetMap data and mm -hmm. then you have to convert it into a like, uh, different format to query it very fast. And then you get the features like uh, roads and uh, buildings and then from the buildings you ex extrapolate them into 3D shapes. Does it have elevation with the roads and the buildings? Not yet. Okay. Uh, I mean, does OpenStreetMap have that? I guess so. Okay. So all I've ever seen from OpenStreetMap as a, as a consumer of their product, so OpenStreetMap is a great place to go to get GIS data. And as the name suggests, it's free open source software. It's free open source data. Um, all I've ever seen them do is serve image tiles. I don't. I, I couldn't see a way to download a vector shape file. Oh, yes. You can. There are distributors like Geofabrik um, where you can download shape files uh, okay. for whole continents or for selected areas. Okay. Like. Is that in the web-based GUI or is no? There an no, API? that's a, a normal web page uh, where they provide download links. You select the area you want to have, and it's not in, under the user interface of OpenStreetMap itself. It's a, a provider called Geofabrik, okay. GeoFactory. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to have to look into that. Um, so thank you for showing that. Unfortunately, only about five people could see it. But it's a really nice looking um, 
3D view of data from a GIS source, OpenStreetMap. Um, so I think I've got five more minutes. Five more minutes and yeah. we have more questions. Right. Hello, uh, thanks yes. for the talk. I'm not an expert in GIS systems, so maybe that sounds a bit dumb, but what, uh, uh, what prevented you from using, uh, because you said you wanted something that's open source, what were the main limitations of a software like uh, QGIS, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, which as far as I know was the, the open source one? What is that name again? Q QGIS. QGIS. Uh, Sorry, I, I say QGIS. So my preference, I had a very strong preference to be um, working in C-sharp. And uh, I can read and understand GDScript, by the way. I have nothing against GDScript. It's just I've, I started learning C-sharp in like 2007. And so I, I've been, and I've got a really big library. So not using QGIS, the main thing there was that if you wanted to work in the code base, you had to be in C or C++. And I'm not enthusiastic about that. And that's just a personal preference. And, and so I'm thinking that there are other people out there with the similar personal preference. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to rule the world with this. I'm just trying to fill some niches. Other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, so on the topic of humanitarian toolkit and how you could use this kind of GIS implementation. So uh, I would really want to hear some expansions on that. Is it kind of like it would allow you to scan an area after a disaster to then check, mm -hmm. like kind of highlight certain areas where, right. well, forests and stuff? Are uh, so currently, emergency management, government officials, and non-government organizations are already using GIS. And so exactly your, your question, if I, is it fair for me to restate that as um, what would it do for yes. these people? They know what they need. And I'm suspecting that two things are going on. One, they probably don't want to pay the cost of ArcGIS, especially the non-governmental organizations because they're strapped on their budget, number one. Number two, if they need something very special, for example, in North Carolina we get a lot of hurricanes. And when we get a lot of hurricanes, what happens is the culverts wash out in a certain area. But as the ambulance is trying to get from the ambulance station to the nursing home to help evacuate those people in the nursing home, after the hurricane, they're driving and then they come up to a place where a culvert has washed out. So they have to back up and drive, and drive a longer route. So one of the things I think they need is a way to correlate all of the closed roads after a storm. So that once one person finds it and he enters it into the database, everybody else knows that that road is closed and you can reroute based on that knowledge. So, I'm, I'm looking at the wrong person. <laughs> so, what will it do? That will be driven by the users. I think they might not be getting everything they want from Esri, who, who's the people who make ArcGIS. Yeah, so, it's, so it's a way of basically having something that is more modifiable. Uh, Close, closer to the end users. Yes. Uh, we have something in Sweden actually where they use this in mines uh, because you have people driving. Th oh, yes, I didn't know how far. Uh, we, we have a company, uh, I don't know the name of them exactly, but they have this kind of system, and I know that they're looking for people. There are game developers where they have uh, in mines a system to kind of outline where uh, the tunnels are. Because in mines, it's really easy to drive with a truck, and you don't see the corners, so you don't know when another truck is incoming. So it sounds like it's something similar to that, uh, where basically it's a way of having that information yeah. more real time. I think, so <clears throat> I want to respect the time here, and it's time to draw this to a close. Uh, I think that there's plenty of people competing in this space, um, but I still think that there's a need for a few things that, you know, this kind of, this project will be worth our while to undertake. And with that, uh, Sorry, I, I don't, 
you know, there's another speaker, and he probably has slides. So, so. Um, please, if you're interested in talking more, find me. I'm here not only today, but I'm here tomorrow. Uh, please strike up a conversation with me, and, and maybe we can find some synergy. Thank you very much.